I'm tired. I, I, I can't do that again. I, I know now that is not mine to do. On my week 40 check-in, we're going to talk about how sometimes the universe gives you opportunities to learn what not to do. Plus, we'll check out a dramedy cue which breaks two of my own rules of production music. Nope. What is happening, YouTube? This is Dave Croft. Welcome to my week 40 check-in for my 52 cues, where I am committing for the entire year to write one cue per week and then come on YouTube, talk about that cue, also talk about other things that are going on in the industry, in my career, in my life, or, or whatever. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for joining me. If this is your first time, I would ask that you you like the video and consider subscribing. Uh, I know every YouTuber you've ever seen asks that, but it wasn't until I started doing my own YouTube videos that I realized that the liking, subscribing, the commenting, that really does help composers just like you find me. So, so if you find this helpful, liking, subscribe, all of that YouTube business really does help spread the word. So I would appreciate that. Also, speaking of appreciation, I want to give a special word of thanks to my Patreon patrons who help make this channel possible. And we will be talking more about my Patreon at the end of the video. So, um, so if, if I'm vibing kind of low, it's because I am just like, I'm just r completely, completely wrung out. I've spent the last two weeks, almost two solid weeks, any, any, any spare time I had in the studio was dedicated to working on a very large audiobook project that I, I've had on, on deck, I, I think since mid-August. I think the first recording session started in August. Uh, it's, a, it's about a 12 and a half hour audiobook with an amazing author, with an amazing story. And when it gets published, I'll, I'll talk about it and, and all of that. But, uh, and, and I'm no strangers to audiobooks. And even last week, I talked about some of what I've been doing, like with the dog clicker to make editing and everything. But man, I, I was unprepared, even as late as last week. I, I looked at last week's video and I have this kind of sparkly optimism about the editing process. But going through the, 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 the QC phase, quality control phase of audiobook editing completely wrung me out and has all but convinced me that I, I am not cut out to be an audiobook producer. As far as any, uh, any, any full time, really dive into it. And I have huge respect for audiobook narrators, obviously, but audiobook post-production editors. I, wow, guys. I, I, but I, I know that that is not, that is not mine to do. And like I said, last week I talked about how we use this dog clicker to put spikes in the waveform and the first pass of editing went pretty well where I'm, where I'm taking out obvious bobbles and that kind of thing, it was going through and cleaning it up. But where I really got in the weeds was the quality control pass and realizing that, that, that not only do I not have the stamina, I think if that's the right word, the stamina for audiobook production, but some of the, the limitations of my, my equipment or my studio space really, really shown through. Limitations such as I, I'm not in a soundproof studio. 
I, I am in a, a room above a garage in a neighborhood in Orlando. And while I do have, you know, bass traps and I have, you know, sound reinforcing curtains and I have panels on the wall and I have done everything to control reflections. And I even have a little vocal booth, like this little thing here. This is a, what you can't see is, is a vocal booth set up in the studio space. And so the sound quality itself, I'm very happy with. Although parenthetically, it was a real challenge to, to set the mic up in the exact same position. Even like the rotation of the microphone will affect the timbre of the voice and trying to make one audiobook recorded over six different, no, yeah, six different recording sessions over three weekends across two months and make that all sound like one continuous session. That was a challenge that, that. I, w I was, it's not like I wasn't prepared for, but that, that really presented its own set of challenges, the c consistency of sound, making sure that the, the narrator, you know, ate the same thing that day so that her, her voice sounded the same, making sure that, that she had plenty of tea. And, and uh, we also found out that, uh, that what she ate during lunch would affect how she sounded after the lunch break. Absolutely. So there was one day where we had a ton of challenges because her, she came back from lunch and she had had Brussels sprouts, which completely made her stomach act up. And so, you know, recording through stomach gurgles and all of that. So it wasn't the quality of, of, of this, of the sound I was getting. It was the challenge of being in this space, which I've, which I've run into before. I've run into just, I'm recording, you know, shaker or something and a plane will go by and I might have to take another take. Okay. But when you're recording audiobooks, it's just raw, naked voice. And so you can't hide anything. And so even though during the session, there were several times where we'd have to stop a take and restart because a car would be going by or a plane or, or, or anything anything, maybe somebody slammed a door downstairs or, or, or stomach gurgles, or of course that wouldn't have anything to do with outside, but, but I didn't catch them all. And it wasn't until the, the QC phase where I am quite literally playing every single track, following along with the text, making sure there weren't any errors and hearing like a car going by that I didn't catch live. And so I have to go in and automate like a frequency notch to try to mask that car. Usually around anywhere between like 90 hertz to 115 hertz, usually. But automate that. Turn it on, either automate the, uh, the bypass or, or the, the filter notch or whatever. And that slowed everything down. And by the end of it, my rough napkin math was it took me almost two hours to QC every hour of finished audio. This is on top of my first editing pass where I went through and pulled out all the spikes made with the dog clicker, which there were two or three, I think three that I did not catch on my initial pass, which means if I had not done my QC pass and sent that up to audible, this sound would have ended up in the final audio. You have to do a QC pass. So I sat down, got up bright and early Saturday morning, like 6 a.m., I'm in the studio, and I start my QC pass thinking, you know, I'd already spent the entire week before, uh, actually, it probably been almost two weeks, I think, full of, full of editing, where I went through and, and did all the, the spike editing, the rough editing. So I thought uh, maybe an hour 25 or, 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 or an hour and 15 minutes per finished hour. Nope. 
almost two hours per finished hour. So literally all day, all day Saturday, all day Sunday into Monday morning. And I just, I just painted myself into a corner. In my mind, I was going to spend a few hours Saturday, a few hours Sunday and be done with it. But I was, I was just not prepared for the QC pass exposing the limitations of my studio. Now, I am mega proud of the end result. I am exceedingly proud of the end result. But I, I don't think that's mine to do. I have all the, the tools, you know, I've got logic, I've got recording set up, I've got nice microphones. I've, I've invested in vocal booths. But I think I've learned, much like I learned about being a professional drummer, that may, maybe this is not mine to do anymore. I got into audiobook production because, you know, some, some say I have a, a, a radio-friendly voice, and I've done podcasting for years and years and years, and I really enjoy being a podcast producer because it, it's not this type of editing. It, it's, yes, you have to go in and edit bobbles and that kind of thing, but I've done that, and I really enjoy it, and so either as voiceover talent or as a producer, audiobooks are kind of like the next logical step of that. But this, this was a whole new thing. This was a whole level of intense that I'm just, I'm just not sure that I have the stamina for. And you know what? Just like with learning about the drumming stuff, that's okay. That's okay. I'm not a failure because I've learned that that's, that's, that's not a path I want to walk down. That's not a, a career tangent that I want to explore. That's all right. I'm not a failure for that. Just like if, if you're watching this and you're thinking about getting into production music, this whole channel is about production music. My whole professional world revolves around production music. But if you get into it and you do it a little while and you realize, you know what, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm cut out for this, that doesn't make you a failure. And you can even have success with the things you did before finding out that that's not yours to do for the rest of your life. I'm, I'm in the middle of reading or listening to an audiobook by uh, an author named Drew Hayes. It's called uh, Underqualified Advice. Really funny. I love Drew Hayes as an author. Very funny guy. And the audiobook is fantastic. We'll put a link to that in the description below. But one of the things he says talking about writing is you, you've got to love it. And, and, and we hear like, you have to be passionate about it. And I've talked about on the channel how there are times I just don't feel like writing. And that's okay. And that's not what we're talking about. But you've really got to enjoy it. You've got to love it. You've got to love being in the studio. You've got to love sitting down at a doll and, 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 and working out the musical Sudoku puzzle of, of, of production music and mixing and all of that. And you've got to love it because if you're looking to make a career out of it, you're going to do it the rest of your life, or at least a very large portion of the next chapter of your life. And if you don't love it, not that you can't have a love-hate relationship, but if you don't love it, then maybe it's not yours to do. And I'm here to tell you that that's okay. That's okay. I love the idea of producing audiobooks, but when it comes down to it, I, I, don't, I don't think it's mine to do. And it wasn't until walking through a, a really big audiobook that I discovered. So maybe you have the opportunity to write an album 
10, 15 tracks of one type of cue, 15 dramedy cues. And you get on the, you get, you get on the other side of that at the end of your 15th cue and you're sitting there blinking tears of exhaustion out of your eyes. And you're, you're like, that's not mine to do. And I'm here to tell you, it'll be okay. It's okay. Go find whatever it is you're meant to do. And I believe the universe, God, spirit, whatever, the universe will give you the fortitude to do that. That's what I believe. So what about you? Any stories, anything that you've gotten into and and you're like, nope, this is not mine to do. I'm proud of it and I'm happy I did it, but I won't do that. So with all that in mind, let's check out a cue that I recently wrote that I'm so exhausted. I'm so exhausted. This doesn't even have a title. I'm realizing that live, like right now. I'm not going to retake. I'm not going to redo this take. It's called Dramedy 7 because that's the kind of week that I've had. Uh, This is a cue written during one of our recent live streams or just last week's live stream that breaks two two of my own cardinal rules of production music. See if you can spot what those are. was Dramedy 7. Apparently, there's no title for it. Oh, man. Uh, if, it, if you're wondering why it's called Dramedy 7, it's because I'm right in the middle of this uh, album project where I am writing a whole album of these hip-hop-flavored dramedy cues. That's why we talked about one last week. It's why I've done, what, like two or three in a row in the live stream. But uh, but he- here I am. And so only one cue, two cues last week. I, I, I've, I'm well off pace of my three, three per week that I talked about at the beginning. I'm hoping to make up for it. But uh, this is called Dramedy 7, and it breaks two, two of my cardinal rules that I just talked about last week. <laughs> just last week, I was like, we give, we have rules. We have rules so that our editors can edit easily, right? And there are two rules that I broke. The code is more what you call guidelines than actual rules. First, starting on tonic. Which this one, this one's the easier one to kind of fudge. This cue starts, uh, it's, it's, this goes back and forth between this like B diminished thing to E dominant seven thing. It's kind of going going back and forth between these two chords here. 
the other, the other cardinal rule that I break, and this is the big one. This is the one that might earn me, might earn me a rejection. And yeah, it is ending on the downbeat. It still ends on the tonic, but I don't end on the downbeat of the measure. Okay, that's this this might earn me a rejection cuz I, I it this is such a stylized type type of a cue that I, I think I can get away with uh, 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 uh. so it's on the and of 4 instead of so how can i get away with this first of all why is it just because I'm bored? No, it's because I really, honestly, and earnestly felt like this, that this melody, this the vibe of this cue and everything, I felt like I can get away with it. But with with two, two or three <laughs> under things to understand. The first thing is, is that is that I'm in a dramedy cue. And dramedy cues can more easily break some of the rules, quote unquote, mm, break the rules, <laughs> break the rules. I feel like Joey and friends. I'm sorry. Anyway, the, uh, so the rule of ending on, on the button, the, some, some of the other rules that dramedy cues often break are staying in one key. Dramedy cues can be very chromatically uh, angular because that makes it kind of funnier and makes it more quirky and more unique. So dramedy can pull that off. The other the other thing I do is I make sure that that last note feels unequivocally and without question the last note. So the and of four typically wouldn't have the um, the big it wouldn't have a kick drum. Two and three and four and. But I've got the, the kick drum hitting again. I make sure that everything lands. I make sure to trim all of my loops and everything so no, there's no energy or anything carrying past it, no rhythmic energy. And I have a riser pushing into that final, final downbeat, even though the riser all throughout the cue beforehand has pushed into beat one. Now I'm pushing into beat four. I have another little swoosh and I have this flexitone sample, which I, I, I really, really love. I'm in the middle of the stream. I'm like, I need a flexitone. Then I, I start thinking, do I have a library that has flexitone? And, and I don't, as it turns out, but splice to the rescue with a one shot. And so I'm, I'm got all of this energy. <laughs> So I make that hit it as hard as I can. That makes sense in context of the cue itself. But we'll see. We'll see. And remember, I mean, these are rules, but they're not really rules. They're mostly guidelines. Mostly guidelines. So uh, so it's a dramedy cue, which means pizzicato strings to the rescue. And these are the, the same pizzicato setup from previous week. In fact, what I did was I imported several tracks from the previous dramedy cue to, to save time. So I imported just, you know, command I import and in logic, you can select things to import from another session. You can import the content, you can import the plugins, you can import the routing, the aux sends, and everything. And so I imported my strings. I imported, including the orchestral sub, which we talked about last week. I also imported the snaps, and I think I imported the claps as well. And with those, in addition to importing the sends, I also imported the, uh, the actual samples. The, the recordings and just time stretched them and made them fit again. Why? To save a little bit of time. And because I'm, I'm working on a full album of these dramedy cues. 
So I, I, meant to, I meant to mention one other thing about how, when, and why you break the rules. I, I, I talked about how I, I, it's dramedy, and so dramedy can get away with some of, some of this rule bending. I talked about really sticking the landing on that, on that button. But also, this is the only, the only track on this whole album that is going to break this rule. And every other track on this album, every other track on, I believe, if memory serves me, every other track on the two previous albums I've done all end on the downbeat. So this feels like an anomaly. And as such, I think we'll, we'll, we'll sail through. I believe that. And, and if not, if the publisher comes back at me, I'm not going to dig my heels in and say, this, this is it. This is my creative vision for Dramedy Q number seven. <laughs> no, I'll fix it. Bum, 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 dun, dun, dun. I'll just add one extra uh, instead of a little chromatic walk. Down. Bum, 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 bum. That's how I'm going to end that if I need to. But I hope not. So starting off with this low call and response between the pizzicatos. Boom, boom. And this this is I this has this a bouncy feel, which is dictated by this big beat loop. I mentioned last week how I feel like hip hop is trending towards breakbeat sampled drum loops again. Not not that trap is going anywhere. I really don't think. I think 808s and stutters are here for at least another few years. But I feel hip hop, at least in production music world, kind of trending back towards towards this. So I've got this big beat. Notice I do have a a I've side chained an EQ on this. And this is this is getting its input sidechain from my pizzicato low. And what I'm able to do here is that which is it the VSL or is it the symph okay, it's the symphobia one. So whenever the pizzicato hits, I want to push the the kick drum out of the way. Essentially, essentially the kick drum here. And this low frequency about 100 hertz or so. And this is a, this is a way to use side chaining to have your cake and kind of eat it too. I don't want to sacrifice the low end of my low strings. And uh, while I'm using the the pizzicato low to trigger the side chain, I'm actually wanting to make sure that that this frequency of the orchestral sub really comes through. that kind of fat sub sound, which I actually talked about last week. But I don't want to just full on side chain. I don't want to EQ all the low ends out of the sub. I don't want to EQ all the low ends out of my, my big drum loop. And I don't want to just do a straight side chain. And if you're not familiar, what side chaining does is, is it takes the input signal from one sound source to trigger an effect on another sound source. This happens in EDM all the time. The kick drum hits, it triggers a compressor, it pushes everything out of the way. And that's why you get the whoa, whoa, pumping of a lot of dance music. Well, we can use that as a mixing tool to solve issues like kick and bass on top of each other. So whenever the, the kick would hit, it would push the bass out of the way. Or in this instance, whenever the bass hits, it pushes the kick out of the way. But because I'm using a drum loop, and because this is so kind of sparse, I, I, I don't want to, to sacrifice all of the upper end of my drum loop when the, when the kick or when the bass hits. If it was just a straight compressor, then the whole drum loop would duck. And I don't want the whole drum loop to duck. What I really want to it, what I really want to happen is I want just one narrow frequency, the frequency that's overlapping where the, the low end of these strings are hitting. 
And so I use a dynamic sidechain using the Neutron EQ. And so you see it's only pushing out this area. And if I've done my job right, then you don't even notice it. So when the kick isn't, or when the bass isn't happening, the kick sounds nice and full. You get that 100 hertz right, right through the mix. But when it is occurring, then it pushes that 100 hertz notch out of the way just enough to where I can have both sounds living in that 100 hertz range. So claps, snaps, new shaker, just an egg. Hard pan, left and right. And then that flexitone. Uh, what a flexitone is, if you're not familiar with uh, the flexitone, it's a percussive instrument that is a little strip of metal that has little mallets on either side. And so you hit it and you wobble it, it goes wah, wah, wah. It sounds really, really goofy. I'm actually kind of surprised I don't have one considering all of the other toys I have. All that means is I've never played a show, like a musical theater show, that called for flexitone. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have the same reason I have sirens and slide whistles and nearly all of the percussion toys I have. All right, so uh, so as as I am progressing, I layer up, add octaves to my my pizzicatos here. I bring in a another drum loop. And this one has some congas to it, making sure to EQ these so that they're not right on top of each other. That's one of the challenges when you're, when you're dealing with multiple drum loops. Is you really have to, to carve space out so that everything fits nice, nicely together. Okay. Then I bring in my ukulele. Funky ukulele, that was something that, that was specifically requested during this album to have a few cues. And uh, th it was the uke, the uke part which kind of drove this whole thing. And I like, I like this uh, B diminished, it's in first inversion, so. And, and I am kind of sitting, I'm not sitting on, on the B here. I'm actually playing like, like this F, F, A, B, D type of chord. I mean, it's a B diminished chord, but uh, it's an inversion and I'm playing the roots inversion, which gives it just this really kind of unsettled. But be, these, these chords are very, very much like, I don't know, kind of like a, a gypsy jazz, Django Reinhardt kind of vibe to it. And that's what I was going for. And this is, this is the first recording I made with my, uh, my upgraded ukulele. I, I actually, I like ukulele so much. I mean, I've got, got like two, one, two, three, I already have four ukuleles. And, um, and so I upgraded and got the Martin TK1 tenor uke, which is beautiful, plays beautifully. It's koa wood. And I, I figured, I figured ukulele wasn't, wasn't going away. So, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to actually invest in a, in a nice one. And so this one sounds really, really nice. All right. So going into my breakdown, I bring in a secondary drum loop which sounds a little bit more filtered. Also, I have this little funky bass, all right, which, which takes the, um, which takes a stock Logic bass, runs it through a guitar rig, kind of wah, which I think sounds, which I think sounds kind of cool. It's not really, it's not the main attraction, so it's far down in the mix. Have some other elements. I have a, uh, another tambourine, tambourineish loop with a hi hat backbeats. Some uh, crash one shots, suspended cymbal roll. 
So into the breakdown, bring everything back. Kind of thin out the ukulele so it's just, it's the same two chords, just two chords back and forth, but just, um, just thumb, thumb strum. Bring in part of the melody, down an octave, not the full melody. I'm going to save that for when I return to my A section here. A little riser. Go to the highly filtered sound. Edit point. Big edit point for editors. And then into that flexitone. Now, that flexitone is... is the publisher's either going to love it or hate it. But even still, I'm going to give them a pass. I'm going to give them an alternate mix without without the flexitone. And if they don't like it, they'll just use the, the mix with no flexitone. I'd rather have it and then give them an alternate without it than not give them at all and, and not have the opportunity for them to hear the greatness that is the flexitone. And then, of course, ending the whole cue with uh on, on the end of four and again we will see we'll see if they dig it but i hope i hope you dig it i hope that was helpful and i hope that you had a stellar week 40. like i mentioned earlier this is a cue that was written during one of my recent music production live streams i do live streams every single week and this is a benefit to my Patreon patrons. If that's something that you're interested in, then uh, check out the Patreon information below. You don't have to. If you never give me a dollar, it's completely okay. But um, but I, I would appreciate it. And I want to give a special word of thanks to my Patreon patrons who give their actual real life money to keep things going on here. Like I mentioned at the top, if you like the video, please do consider liking and subscribing to the channel. It really does help composers just like you. So like I mentioned, if uh, if if, uh, if you've had an opportunity to, uh, to learn what not to do in your career, I'd absolutely love to hear it uh, in the comments below. I make every effort to respond to the comments and I absolutely do read them all. But I'm gonna go get some sleep and I will see you next week. Until next time, peace.